start the program. So we're here tonight to uh, honor the long and productive careers of Clyde Jamaru and Harry Ako. And um, they have prepared a, uh, a slide presentation that runs through the highlights of their career. Before we, uh, before we get started on that though, I also wanted to, to thank um, Christine for her years of support of Clyde and our efforts. It's, uh, and I personally, I have uh, been at Clyde and Christine's through the night multiple times working on grant deadlines making it to FedEx just as the FedEx truck pulled up into the parking lot. So uh, truly a dedicated um, extension family and uh, much, uh, much appreciation. And we got the grant, so that was the good part. <laughs> but uh, I had prepared a little bit of summary of uh, the backgrounds of Clyde and Harry, but I understand that they have put that in the program, so I will let them present in their own ways. But it's uh, been a very full career, and all of us here, I think, have uh, benefited or from either direct uh, information they've developed or collaborated with them or have been inspired by their efforts. So. Uh, Kai and Harry, do you want to um, um, lay, you present? Yeah. You want to bring the ladies now? Okay. <laughs> So he's a homegrown product. 
born and raised in o o Oahu. He went to Iolani Kailua Maimai Elementary School, Kawanamakua, and also Roosevelt High School. He would go to the mainland. He got his bachelor's at UC Berkeley. He's one of these guys that they don't mess around with the master's degree. Go straight for the PhD. <laughs> Washington State University, then he was postdoc uh, at the University of Washington, you know. Now, Harry was telling me that the guys who really, really, is, he said the schools weren't that important, but I disagree. Those are pretty good schools. But he said, uh, was it? You had some pretty good teachers as well, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see. 40 years at the University of Hawaii in the Department of Molecular Biosciences and Bioengineering. Ten of those years. <laughs> and ten of those years, he was out in the department chair as well. Okay. Um, he did have his own projects uh, separate, but I think the real connection with aquaculture, if you take a look at this one, he was on the technical committee for CTSA for 28 years. And he was <laughs> he was the chair for 22 years. <laughs> and I guess it's good, I can say it now, but a lot of times he used to give us a little bit of inf inside information how the, the voting was going and that kind of stuff too. <laughs> okay. My turn. My turn. Home right. grown product. Born and raised. I send this. Yeah, I send this. Um, especially when I give uh, speeches out. So I'm a public. I'm a product of the public school system. Mm. Royal Elementary, Central Intermediate, McKinley High grad. I got actually two. Oh, 41. 41. <laughs> Great. Uh, I will get my uh, my bachelor's and my uh, master's degree at University of Hawaii uh, at Manoa. And then for some remarkable reason, and I'll actually go a little bit more into detail, I got my doctorate at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and everybody says how special that is, and I will learn really quick how, how true that is. So I spent my first year at the university, uh, excuse me, I was an extension specialist. And that's why I put that funny little shirt over there. I got that from Sarah Peck. Uh, she's an extension agent for Sea Grant. And a lot of people don't understand what is an extension agent or an extension specialist and what we do. So this is probably the best <laughs> answer that I can have. Girl or girl, yeah, that's us. Uh, let's see, I would stay at the uh, Seagrad and then also at the uh, MBB. Uh, and according to the records, I was also doing some teaching there. So at the University of Hawaii for 24 years. I was at OI for 12. And then uh, after that, I consulted for between two and three years to, to make it up close to 40 years like Harry. Okay, so that's the extent of my. because two of my teammates actually came tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and anyway, well, I should say Judge Chang. <laughs> um, one of the things about uh, high school, when I take a look at this picture, I, I was thinking for a while, so what was I thinking about? I actually had to beg my mom to let me play football, and my father is the one uh, who is actually an overrider. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the one point I wanted to put in this one is any place that I will learn the value of hard work, and Gary and Nathan will actually, I'm sure, agree with me. This is where we learn about hard work. Okay. Um, the other part that's important that will actually help me quite a bit is the value of teamwork. And that is one of the key parts of the special extension, and what we did at the university uh, was very, very important, I think. I learned the basics. <coughs> oh yeah. One of the things though when you get married to a cowgirl. <laughs> so on occasion I learned a different part of agriculture. So I would consider and I, 
I'm not a real cowboy cowboy, but I am getting close to, to it. So <laughs> remember there was a trip to the conference we had to go to. Um, what would happen is uh, with uh, Christine's ranch, there are several small uh, family ranches that are around, but they would get word that we're coming through, so they would line up and get everything ready for us to do. So normally it was branding, uh, mending fences and that kind of stuff. But it used to be branding. And we do this roughly, I forgot how long you can recall. I don't know, I don't I forgot. Or anyway, it's pretty much once a year. Yeah, we were, we were going back and forth and I became a cowboy. <laughs> Close to it. <laughs> This is the part that I would learn very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I will read the quote that was out there. I am, I am afraid to love a man, but I ain't afraid to shoot a man. <laughs> anyway, so we've been married 25 years, and so far she hasn't shot me yet. <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> Mom and Dad on the top, Carl Church Senior and Mary Culture Church are they passed away unfortunately. But I'll tell you a little story about uh, Christine's dad. <coughs> when she told her that she was dating me, he flew out of, from Colorado to come check me out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember I was making dinner and something and he came up to me and he says, do you really know what you you do you want you what you're doing? <laughs> and I thought he was talking about making dinner. <laughs> 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 Tell me, this boy, you still don't understand <laughs> what's going on. Uh, anyway, like I said, we got along very well. Um, my my parents, Chico and Satoru Tomaso de Nise, um, they are getting along in the years, as you can see. And one of, one of I guess, my regrets is that I didn't actually take the time as I should to actually be a good son and visit them or be there with them that much. I'm trying to make amends now, but we'll, we'll see. Anyway, my mom's in the home. My dad's still at, uh, still at home. My, my sister usually do most of the work uh, taking care of them. I'll share you a little bit of story, though, with my mom. Uh, she did something very special for me when I was going to the University of Tokyo. And that's when my son, he's in there someplace, that carrying the baby back there. He was, uh, I was a single parent at the time, so she and my, my father actually could not believe that I was going to go to the University of Tokyo. And I would need somebody to babysit him. <laughs> and so it's between um, in April and October, about I think three years, that I would be going. And it's anywhere from four to six weeks that she would be taking care of. I mean, they would be taking oh, I say she because I can guarantee you it was my mom. That was yeah. <laughs> one, and one time when I was up there, I got a letter from her, and she would tell me about what they were doing and, you know, those kinds of things. Something only a mother, you know, would do. Just to give you an idea, that's why the character of my mom, I really appreciate it. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's uh, and that's why this is a tribute to these guys too. They're really special people. There's another very special person in my life. Uh, he is Dr. Jim Shockley. Um, I was very lucky to be invited to be the keynote speaker at the um, 55th Hawaii State Science Center. And I used this slide in, in it just to tell you how special he is, okay? Um, I also make sure, especially to the local kids, one of the primary lessons that I wanted them to take home, is in easy, please in English, is not a very good English to consider, <laughs> especially if you want to be into a professional field. Okay. And when I was growing up, it was all pidgin English and that kind of stuff. So I had a big waking up when I went to college, especially to graduate school. Um, anyway, it is Jim Jackson that would actually take the time to teach me about how to write and also how to speak in English. 
<laughs> and he will also take some time to teach me how to become a researcher. Okay? And the most important part, and a lot of people say this is one of the traits that I have. I give everything I can for my clients, friends, and what have you. But I think I learned this from him because you do not believe what he did for me to become what I, who I am today. Okay, so that's why I put this tribute for him. Ah, one of the best parts is I was doing kind of a little, uh, not a little, I mean search on the internet, and I came across him. He had won an environmental award. And then I, of course, all I do is I let, let super sleuth go there. <laughs> and she found out the address, and we found out he's living in Colorado, and also a phone number. So since the beginning of this year, we've been conversing again. And one of the best things I actually had, I think what they cashed in some free miles and they came over to visit. And one of the best things I ever was able to do was actually tell him personally what, you know, how much I appreciate it. He didn't believe it. And I, I told him, he said, what you did for me, he said, is, is important. It carried on all through my career. And that's the guy. Okay, so you know my secret now. <laughs> One more person, a very special person that I need to also uh, thank uh, during my career. Because we had some challenges, as I said before, and especially on the bottom right, <laughs> that time was when I was traveling to uh, uh, Japan. I think it was for three years straight, twice a year. And I did, like I said, he's gone through a lot to allow his old man to go follow or pursue the career that he did. So he also had to pay part of it. So anyway, thank you over there, son. <laughs> One more person, very special person, I would meet actually when I started work at the Oceanic Institute. His name is Joy Duimora, and unfortunately he has passed on as well. Um, when I met him um, at Moli Fish Pond, and just started to understand what he could do and what he knew. I, I told myself, I want to be like him, okay? Except that it's funny because we can talk a whole night about this guy, his exploits, and all the things that he do, does. So anyway, come check us out. I think Susan actually is related to Jane, yeah? His wife. Uh, I cannot, uh, yeah, there's not enough time in one evening to talk about all the things this guy did. But he's the one that would tell me, he says, you want to make a difference, he said, go back to school. Okay? I, I do want to leave one tidbit behind. I know some of us here were at the Oceanic Institute, and if you were on uh, news, <laughs> if you knew him, you also knew his wife, Jane. Okay? Because if you're going to make the phone call to go visit and talk to Josh, you got to go to Jane. <laughs> The, and the one thing that I remember most, uh, pleasant, I think the guys who went with me, uh, you remember she made this sour sap pie? Oh, sugar cookie crumb cross, whipped cream, pond, believe it. And it's one of those things too, because you know, if you're going to go there, don't just expect to go uh, back up and go home. No, no, no. After you finish the job, you're gonna have to sit down at the table and you gotta sit whatever she's prepared and you gotta talk story for a little while. Okay? Very, very that's why she is a very special lady. And this this whole group, well, I tell you. Anyway, cannot not enough time in the night to talk about her and him. Okay. I would end up at the Oceanic Institute actually twice, once after I got out of college and uh in fact, I think it was Jim Shackley that pointed out, they get one job at the old area in And again, I went back to, um, let's see, after I, I got my master's degree. Okay. Now, Oceanic Institute, and the stuff that we do, and I know the guys who are with me here, at the time, you know, we were a state of the art. No question about it. We were doing things there that was very, very special. Uh, and then on top of that, he said when we started to do some technology transfer, you can see some of the places that we're going. He said, you know, pretty well. 
So that was another experience for me as far as the uh, aquaculture. I really appreciate it. Of course, we had some differences of opinion as well. But then, <laughs> it, it, is, it is like one of the places where I learned my craft. In fact, this is when I think, let's see. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> this is where I would get my doctorate degree. So I talk about the University of Tokyo. One of the problems with me is that I never really took the time to understand how significant this school is. Harry always reminds me, a lot of people out there too just cannot believe that I got my degree from this, this school. Okay, and the way it happened, I have to thank the one gentleman on your right, and actually he's sitting right over there, Dr. James Ting Lee. Well, he used to be the PI of the project at the time, now he's a the head of uh, CTSA, but he will make an arrangement with his major professors. I think his major professor was the, the top one, right? Yeah, um, Hirano Sensei, and then Hanyu Sensei was also the like a professor. <coughs> but I would work with Ayuga Sensei. At the time, he was a guy that had all of the assays that could measure the various hormones in reproduction in fish. And that's what us, that's where I actually uh, went there for. Anyways, <clears throat> like I said, this is a whole new story because I forgot to include all of the different guys that I would meet, and this is a whole career that was formed just by this uh, linkage. And I I owe Dr. Lee that opportunity. Okay, how about I have? <laughs> I know I never thanked him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I would find out the, afterwards. I thought, oh, cool, I got one. I, I'm in graduate school. Then they would tell me what I had to do. <laughs> so because the situation here is that it is like um, it's not like in the United States. I didn't have to go to classes, but they would have I had to put together my publications, and then I could make a presentation, and then. I had to take a foreign language test, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But anyway, so they said I was the first American that was coming through for them in this land. So they said, they said okay, we set the bar a little bit high, 10. I got to do 10 publications to get, and then put that together with my teachers. Okay? And that turned out to be not, I didn't worry that too much. What I was worried about was the foreign language requirement. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily they told me, no worry, English is one of them. <laughs> so, so I chose French as a second. And the reason I told that, because there's Chris Kelly over there. Chris was my office mate when I was at the Oceanic Institute. And he said, no problem. He said, I'm going to teach you how to, I had to learn how to read French. So what he did was he brought all his comic books <laughs> and then the, 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 the dictionary. I could take a dictionary. <laughs> so make it short, that's how I learned French, how to read French. And I passed. <laughs> so I did it in three years. Okay. There was a, a time requirement because I think one of the major pros was going to retire. I think 65 is a mandatory retirement. So I had to finish in a, in a short time, and I did. Oh, this is also not just dependent on me. There's a whole team that was present at the Oceanic Institute because we had this big program, and a lot of folks were involved. Some of them are here tonight, starting in a left-hand corner there. There's Bernie Sato. He's here. I know he's here. Raise your hand, Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> the bottom corner, I know he's not here. That's Jesse Bono. Oh, the guy is good, good. I should remember Jesse. He's from the Philippines. <laughs> On the right, you see uh, that's Chris Kelly and Aaron Moriwaki. And on the top of that is uh, Garrett Miyamoto. Anyway, we had this uh, pretty good team that has developed, and we were doing, like I said, State of the art stuff. I remember one manuscript coming out and talking about uh, how innovative and how 
advanced than our research was. Okay? The guy who obviously was doing the re reviewing didn't know what the Japanese were doing. <laughs> but that's, that's what we had. We were getting some pretty neat stuff getting accomplished. Okay, 1988, I got my degree. Okay, during that time is when probably uh, my relationship with Harriet Cole would become solidified. But we started to, we took advantage of his um, skill in doing fatty acid and amino acid profiles. And also his knowledge about what it meant uh, in our work. He was helping, also helping Sid Crow with the Mai Mai. Uh, like I said, he's a biochemist. So this kind of stuff is kind of like child's play. One thing I asked him, how did we contribute for him? Because we were producing, um, I think Christine reminded me, it's a little over one manuscript per month that we're up to output. And that would help uh, Harry go from associate to full professor. So like I said, everybody was winning. That's the way teamwork works, right? You know, this is one of the uh, uh, products. A couple things I remember why I put this in there. If you look at the middle on the bottom three, it says you can see that there's a change in the location of what I, I am. I'm with Hawaii Sea Agriculture Consultant Services. That's because at this point I actually left uh, the Oceanic Institute. And a lot of people have asked, this is, what is your most significant contribution, if you will? And I'll give you an example. Uh, this is the one that I think for me is the biggest one. I was actually on a consultancy in Indonesia. Uh, a guy, I think Jensen will know who I call it, at the, 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 the DARD would call me in. He said, I need you to go down to uh, and go and see what they're trying to do and give them whatever hints that we could. Uh, he, he knew that so I was part of the team that originally went down. Okay. The other part is that I have to also include that, that bottom because that's the manuscript I produced with Ryan Morishige, Jensen, Harry Ako, and Vernon Sato. And we identified the fatty acid requirements uh, for both milk, mullet and milkfish. And one of the things we found for milkfish was it was capable of producing, I don't know if you guys know what DHA, EPA and all that stuff. But anyway, the milkfish is unusual that it can, it has a ability to uh, synthesize its own. You don't have to add it. Okay, what that meant is that we don't have to depend on the one type of phytoplankton to raise raw first that everybody else had, had to use. Okay. And what I did, I think, uh, where's the army one? <laughs> what I would steal from the Alui Nui folks is that I showed them the tilapia green water technique so that they could produce the phytoplankton really simply and, that, uh, and then basically produce rarifers and move around. They, don't, they aren't connected to a laboratory where they gotta do nanochloropsis, hoculata, like before. And with that, I would find out from uh, Dean Akiyama, actually when he came to a talk at our HA conference, mm -hmm. he's the one that told me, he said, did you know what they're doing in Indonesia? Okay. And he told me that I went down, there was only five of these backyard hatcheries that they asked me to take a look at and make recommendations. He said there are over a thousand mm -hmm. when he came. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the economics of the, what they were doing, I think the normal, uh, on average, a farm would make about 11 times the gross, uh, the average income of Indonesia. If you look at the rural poor, which is what most of these guys were, 50 times. So like I said, this is one of those that really make a big impact, okay? Now keep in mind this scenario, because it'll, it'll come back and you'll see the, uh, problems that we have when we face our society. Okay. I think I was in Guam, another consultancy, 
And Fitz, Bill Fitzgerald would tell me, he says, what are you doing consulting in, in Southeast Asia or wherever? He said, you should go back to Hawaii and try and do something there. At the time, there was nothing. But I had to wait, and sure enough, an <laughs> opening came up at Seagraph. So January 1st, 1995, is when I came to actually work at Seagraph. And working there and doing all kinds of other stuff at the beginning, one of the things that was very, very obvious was we didn't have a facility to do something with. So I had to turn our Winwood Community College project. It was freshwater ornamentals. I converted it into something where we could at least um, do some research and also extension. And there is one individual who doesn't want to be identified by a will anyway. He's Stan Kodama here. Yeah, there he is behind you. <laughs> Stan Kodama, you see all those blue tanks? Okay, so I'm, I'm operating with a limited budget and challenges for sure. He would make me some deals that were unbelievable, but allow me to build the mini so-called so uh, actually facility out there at Wimmer Community College. Okay. Um, yeah, that's him over there. And he did this not just once, several times. The other thing that's pretty interesting is that uh, we had an external evaluation panel at the time for CGRAM. And they, this whole bunch of guys from Washington, D.C. came to evaluate our program. When they saw what we were doing here, uh, the guy's name is uh, Dr. Bob Stickney. So he's also the editor for World of Culture Magazine. He, he would write an uh, article, and he told me he would do this. I, I didn't believe him, but he put, he put that snapshot on the front cover of World of Culture Magazine, just to tell people about what we're doing. Okay, so people started to find out, <laughs> gee, the guys in Hawaii, they're doing some neat stuff out there. Okay, because you got a facility, now you can rock and roll. How you can start doing stuff. Okay, this is just some of the activities that we've done. It's like a class. Um, you can do research, workshops, right? Yeah. And there is one individual that's in the <laughs> in the audience right here. I can't even see him where he is. Ah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So this is the kind of stuff, like I said, when you got a facility, uh, we can do stuff. And that's what we did. Okay. Obviously, I'm not doing this all by myself. So we had to build a team from scratch. Uh, I knew Kathy McGovern Hopkins when she was only Kathy McGovern. That's when we were working at CPOP in Hawaii the first time. Okay. Uh, we would cross, I mean, uh, we separate out. She would actually go into the church, the church field, and I would meet her once more at the World Aquaculture Society Conference. And she had asked me if there's some opportunities in Hawaii. The reason is her father passed away, so her mom was here by herself, and they, they were going to move back. Uh, that's when she was already Kathleen McGovern Hopkins now, and that's what he did. So I told her I had an ornamental fish project you can work with. And that's what she did, but like any of the extension agents, what they'll do is, as you can see, her starting to diversify out to other uh, projects. And she likes working with kids, for sure, okay? And because she's a shrimp person, I figured, whoa, wow, I got a shrimp person, and that, that she's doing freshwater ornamentals. I got a person that can do two different things. And that's kind of how I built <coughs> our program together. You know, Harry reminded me about, uh, this is when our previous project was with the freshwater ornamental group. And then the project had a problem, and I think one of, oh, Fred Dom's over there too. <laughs> one of the problems is that we weren't engaged, to me, in my opinion, we weren't engaging the guys that are here in Hawaii. And we were trying to do something that was in Florida. But this is where we needed to be working with. And we would hook up with Ray Kosaka, and Ray is the one that would inform Harry. One of the one of the um, criticisms about working with the hobbyists, they said that's a hobby, that's not an industry. So anyway, Ray Kosaka is the guy that would inform Harry. He dealt with discus, those fish that he's kind of talking. 
his net, not gross, his net was between 100 to 200,000 a year. So he said, you tell me, is that industry or is that a hawk? <laughs> okay. Well, at the time, he was the president of the Aquarium Society. And again, we're not taking advantage of the local talent. Uh, the Aquarium Society is one of the oldest societies in the United States. Okay, and then when you start to dig around and find out what these guys can do, there's some really high-powered guys in there. And one of them, uh, <coughs> oh, I'm going to get to that next. What he would also offer to us is that uh, a place in the newsletter to publish all the results that we can generate. And this is all kinds of stuff. The one that you see up here is on induction of spawning, but we did a whole statistic. I found it in my uh, data, 30 articles in a short period of time that we had published. Okay, that, I mean, that's the kind of output that we could generate with, the, with this club. Kathy would start to work with this group, and again, <coughs> Some really talented people. So this is um, I forgot his name, Glenn Takashira, and also Mike Mike Yamamoto. Okay, and we're gonna look at the Larto Sartel, and the Larto Sartel is pretty interesting because it has these really elongated fins. <laughs> the value, of course, is uh, much higher, and it about four to five times the common Sartel. The problem is that. To reproduce it, it uh, the male's sexual fin is so long it cannot physically mate with the female. So you can do it if you actually do it artificially. And anyway, so Kathy worked with uh, and documented the genetic trait and also published how to do it artificially. Okay. And the proof for the pudding, you see that's female number nine on the top. That is a homozygous individual for the large trip. The significance of that is that if you meet her with a common sword tail, you can see the output 100% large tail. So the value of that animal is really, really high. The other thing that I was always thought was cool is that that's man-made. There's only one way you can create it. You gotta make it. Okay. So she figured out the genetics. Now this is where we knew something was happening because normally we would publish the results in a journal of aquaculture or World Aquaculture Society. <coughs> I got called by the president or the editor of Tropical Fish Hobbies magazine. CSH is one of the largest uh, magazines in, in, the, in the, I would say the world. <laughs> and they wanted to know more about what we were doing in Hawaii. So they actually paid me 500 bucks a day to write this article. Yeah, I gave the money back to the society. I didn't keep it, but anyway. That, it, just, it just gives you an idea that somebody's taking notice of the stuff that we're doing. Okay. The un unfortunate part is that nobody in Hawaii, even though we have all of this information, nobody in Hawaii has taken that to the next level. And uh, the, the, the fear is just like the orchid industry in Thailand, <laughs> when Southeast Asia is actually formed or founded by two PhDs from Sitar. And the same situation is kind of looming at the same time right now. You can imagine somebody picking up that technology uh, and taking it to the next level. Oh my God. Anyway, that's the challenge that we have. Okay. I get another chance to get a person that can do double duty. Who's Talent and Paper Boy comes available because this is about the time when uh, ADP, I think, started to fall apart. And <laughs> they came to me and asked, is there anything I can So just like with uh, Kathy, I said, you're going to have to do double duty. So you got to work with, you see that? fish on the bottom right. I got a CTSA project to look at Haku. And if you wanted to do that. But the beauty is that she also is a disease specialist, which we also could do. So obviously I picked her up and she's been serving double duty uh, manuscript on the top. Uh, this the latest one came out early this year. Okay. 
Maybe we we'll want my last report. No. That's the one that's dealing with the uh, ethanol, the tilapia that impacts tilapia. Okay. So anyway, you can see how the, the program is being put together piece by piece. The last of the guys that will make up the team is our Dr. Brandy Fox. I will be serving on his PhD dissertation committee. And I will find him at a postdoc in, uh, at HIV doing something that he wasn't real happy with. <laughs> and anyway, his, he had a particular interest in aquaponics at the time. And he came to me and asked me about trying to do stuff. I will roughly get some funding from Japan and he would become like the aquaponics guru for our team. Especially, but he also noticed that he's doing a lot of kind of things around as well. And all of our staff have to publish, so that's uh, Kai Fox's contribution. I have some uh, colleagues that are not part of the team, but not, nonetheless still very important. This is Winston Kong, he's a counselor at Lunar Community College. Uh, I will get introduced to, uh, to him actually several different ways, but let me start off with uh, our inter interaction with Harry. Uh, as you can see, that middle gal is his daughter, um, Natalie Kong, uh, who came, she was actually a music major, right Harry, that would come to try to find a different uh, career, and she wanted to be an MD. I mean, we're talking like, you know, 180 degree turning career. And I, I warned her about Harry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I went to Star Sharp. She succeeded. She finished, she went to UH Med School. She uh, did her, um, what do they call it? Internship on the mainland. Okay, she came and she's now back here uh, in uh, Hilo, where she is training the next generation of medical doctors. Harry can fill you in more about all of those kind of details. But this is, I would serve on her um, master's co uh, community. Okay, now my interaction with uh, this family goes much farther because I work with Winston Kong a lot. Uh, one of the things. Uh, you see it on the bottom slide. Uh, Winter Community College will approach me to try and develop a course called IS-201 Ahumpua'a. And when they first laid out what they had in mind, and I said, <laughs> I knew immediately he said, I'm going to need help. So I went to see Winston, and he helped me design and implement the course. Okay. And interestingly enough, you see that one in, they need that the arrows point to land on a right, where is she? I know you are right now, okay. <laughs> Lenala is part of our first class that we have. And I did not put uh, you know much together to, uh, together, but like I said, what was happening is that these students, because a lot of times uh, Women Community College is a place, they're not traditional students. They're coming back to school looking for a different career. Leonala is one of these. So that's the first class that I get introduced to Leonala. She would go on to get her bachelor's degree and then started to come and sneak around us a little bit, learning, trying to learn more about aquaponics. <laughs> and then she would go on to get her master's degree from the Hawaii Studies at the university. So currently, now you have too many jobs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the more interesting things about uh, my association with Winston. What what is also very important to know, and Winston's not here because um, I have to get my salary every year. So this is one of the ways I get my salary. Every time I thought Winston would get all of what was coming, he never paid me any of it. And then, like I said. You can see that he would get an award very fitting this past year uh, for his volunteers. <coughs> of, uh, not just for me, all the other things that he does. Okay. I guess the story is one of the neat things about my job. 
You get to work with some of the dearest people in the world. Okay. <laughs> I do not know that how much I will be doing this kind of work. And I asked Ari for some help in telling me what his mentoring uh, outcome were. And he said, I only know about 50% of them because he's dealing them with them at the uh, undergraduate level. And he, unlike me, <coughs> kind of follows them all the way through to what they're doing now. The biggest statistic, and probably one that most people don't know about Harry, is that first one there. Look at the number of MDs he is responsible for. Okay? The three lovely ladies on the right are the ones that I would serve on their master's committee. And you can see two of the three actually went on to Mendy, and one of them, Lena Sano, is almost finished with her pharmacy. She will be a pharmacist very soon. Anyway, really spectacular records as far as mentorship. How about a high school? <laughs> on the weight on the bottom, that's an award that you would receive. I've got to read it something. You know, North American Conferences 
and the international one goes all over the world. So I make a wager. I said, you can spot these guys. I'll send you to right? Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> but they already called me up. They said, you got to come over and see what I done. So he did. And I sent him to WRC in Brazil. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, food for the So it's interesting, like I said, these, these publications, you notice they're not typical aquaculture. They're more of the academic type, but nonetheless, still achieving the goal. So his challenge actually was not just for uh, you know, our, our uh, upcoming uh, Objectives. He had to satisfy those of the Department of Zoology, which I thought was a little bit more difficult. I know he did. And that's his wife over there. So proud of him. <laughs> okay, we don't only work with undergraduates and graduate students. On occasion, we also work with high schools. Okay, and I asked uh, Harry if he can send me an example of a high school. And that's one, here, Graham Kwan from Miller Line High School. My example are Jolene Fujita and Mari Kajiwara. The unfortunate part is Harry is much better at doing this than I am. I don't know what happened to my students, but I, if you want to find out more, you're going to ask, ask, ask Harry about uh, his student. Uh, uh, there is a small story. Ah, oh, yeah, Milton. Milton is the one that actually would introduce me to the family of uh, Jolene, I guess, Fujita, right? Yeah. And then anyway, so we had this relationship and we started on a project at their house. And you can see they got some honors with their, their, their products. Anyway, short story that, like I said, we work with a high school level as well. We make a bigger impact, though, when we work with a high school teacher that wants to develop a program. And where is Dali Yogi? Yeah, there is. Kanki High School decides to use aquaculture as a mechanism for teaching curricula. As far as what is after is the STEM skills that we have to uh, accomplish. And anyway, the one that I could help him out directly with is spawning the Chinese catfish. And the reason is that most, I don't know if you guys know, but that's a controlled substance, the hormone up there. So he kind of needs me to use that. <laughs> Anyway, they come with a really innovative program. They make enough money. They can uh, continue their uh, program. And one of the things I want you folks to realize that when you take on this kind of responsibility, very few teachers can actually do this. And so he and his partner, Luke Cameron, are really special. <laughs> How about giving him a... Okay, I was very clear to me that technical stuff, not a problem. I can handle all of that stuff. But one thing I did not know was how to interact with groups. And in a class, a two workshops, uh, learning to lead collaboratively and also strategic planning, it became pretty clear that I'm going to get some more training. And Donna Ching was very, very uh, I was lucky that she recognized, she said, yeah, and why don't you join the Ag Leadership Program that she had developed. And I became part of class nine. The most important part I would learn is also is the uh, strategic planning, but also the facilitation. But probably one thing that even for you guys out there, um, if you wanna keep on having the growth that you need, that national trip to Washington, D.C. was the one that was really the eye-opener for me. And the reason I would meet this man, Dr. Chan Si Ching. I don't know if you folks know about him. He is a faculty member at the CITAR. Anyway, he was the agricultural advisor to Senator Inouye. And this is, I tried to, anyway, that he's the eyes and ears, I guess, of what's happening in the state. So if you folks want to have something happen that's really on the big side, you will have to figure out who has replaced him because he's retired now. Okay? And if there isn't any, he 
better go find one pretty quick. But that's because um, you can't impact what's happening in Washington, D.C. And the reason I know that is on, on that picture on the left. Wait, Maria? Anyway, I use that for two reasons. One is to remind me to tell you about making sure that you make this connection. Because Chauncey was telling me that our interaction started when I was in Seagram. Anything that had to do with aquaculture, he would call me to make sure or get confirmation. So they were listening. Okay? They are listening in Washington. Uh, the other part is that you see I'm at, in a hospital bed. And the problem with me is that I don't know what happened on this day. I mean, I have no recollection. And in fact, that's one of the things I need your help and also targets. Like I just wanted to make sure that I extend the, my warmest appreciation for all of you folks who gave your concerns when I was like this. Uh, I will try to do that uh, more and more. Because Christine <coughs> said there is like 1,500 emails or something like that? Facebook. Oh, Facebook, yeah. And I, I still don't know how to use Facebook. Really well. <laughs> but anyway, that's one of the tasks that I'm going to try and accomplish now that I'm retired. <laughs> but anyway, like I said, something for the, the industry. Make sure you folks know who this person is. Okay. Ah, and here's some of the, I think, major achievements of what we're in, involved in. And I thought this one was a biggie, and it came, I think, also from, well, I still don't know how that, that kid came about. I do know uh, this was actually probably started from Ruth Sanderson, and where was Joe Tabro? Way there in the back. Okay, this is when Joe Tabro was back in the, uh, working at Hawaii, and we had kind of figured out, and also supported by Bruce Sanderson. He actually put some money in our budget to try and get this together and see what the industry wanted. Okay? And it's important, I guess, this is over 10 years old. So you guys might, not, might want to revisit it now to see where the directions have changed or where, where the uh, different partners can help each other. Because with this wish list, you see the stuff in blue? Those are the things I could see that I could impact with what I did. And that's what I and that's what I did. Uh, that's a something like I said. You guys might want to try and do if you want the industry to continue to grow. An example is get out and meet the farmers. I would get a request from Carabozzi Ocean Rider to help them develop their um, seahorse farm, and I actually went out to get uh, funding so that we can do this. Harry plays a very important role in this as well because we found out what the fat acid requirements for both the larvae and also for reproducing of seahorse. Okay, it was significant. And here's the dilemma. <laughs> Remember I showed you that thing about the milkfish and how everybody, it was great work. Now this case is the opposite. They don't want that information to be out. So they approached us and said, asked us not to publish. And I had to, I didn't make the decision by myself. I actually brought it up with the external evaluation panel from the guys from Washington, D.C. And we had, a, we had a good discussion about the situation. Okay. So the decision actually been made it real simple. It's the client. <laughs> so the decision is obviously I knew what would happen, they knew what would happen if we let that information out. So we did not. Okay? Our, ours has always been to protect the industry. And I'll tell you also, I am not, this is not an isolated case. It's more than one like this. Okay, yeah. So when I still can do other things, I used to always carry my camera. Take pictures, they used to not, and I didn't charge them for anything, but they used to make this good. I mean, uh, marketing brochures, and one of the things, I think Susan Makushima, she had a Pacific Tropical Animal Free Project that supported the growth of Ocean Rider and tried to develop their ag tourism component, which they did. 
and one of the things is that they wanted somebody to review what they were doing, and every so often they would find a hole. And like I said, one of the things I recognized pretty quick was that they were collecting the, the lava ring tanks and throwing away all of that stuff that they're collecting. And I knew right away, you know, that, that's the skeleton of the sea loss. If you were to dry that thing, that thing might have value. So this is our first experiment. Lucky I had these small specimen dolls. I was carrying in my camera case. So you can see we put, I think, three in each. And we put, uh, that's, I, I know this is our first one because that's a hand printed $5 per page. We don't know what to charge. So this for we just tried it. Anyway, she think <coughs> two days later, she called, where do you buy those files? <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards she told me, she said they were charging $15 a piece. The one thing I didn't ever do was ask, so how much money had you guys really made? I don't know. But obviously it was making an impact. So that's what the extension guys do, right? Okay. Always, always, always trying to get the best information you can out into the public. And I had a Papa Papa project at the time. I had two my clients, other clients, colleagues that were working with uh, Dr. Aguilar. Jensen had actually recruited Dr. Aguilar to do his postdoc at Oceania Institute. And he would bring with him uh, Dr. Sakakura. And we had this workshop. The only problem is I don't know if there was any big impacts from it. But again, like I said, we would try and always bring the best that's in the world available to Hawaii. And then I think this was actually the idea is hot gold here. Clyde, can you use the mic? Can you use the mic? Ah, oh, the microphone. Really? Was this your idea to have the proclamation or? It was a good idea. <laughs> we, we weren't sure where this came from. We, well, we can figure it was from your group and also Sandra, Sandra Kunimoto, yeah. right? And this is a nice idea. Again, if you look at the um, wish list, it's trying to get everybody to work together. So we had what is called Aquaculture Week. And then I think you guys got our dean of CITAR involved. And the dean wanted to showcase the, what was being what was happening up at the Magoon facility. So we had this big spiel, <coughs> and from my understanding, this is actually went pretty well. Everybody stopped to figure out, wow, we got an industry <laughs> in Hawaii. Okay. Oh, I forgot. I mentioned to Jeff. This is the one I got kind of scared of when he started to show the governor. And he went, yeah, 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 try. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, CTSA project, there is a very clear uh, objective about technology <coughs> transfer. One of the easiest ways to do this is to hold a workshop. And Harry came to me with one of the CTC projects, he said, okay, almost power, we need the, um, the workshop. And so the first plan was to just have it at the Excise building in the conference room, since 50 guys maybe. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we put the call out, I think in like two or three days, it's already full. So we realized real fast, they said, we gotta do something different. <clears throat> um, Harry gets a hold of Build Your Hall 150. It sees 200 people, and as you can see in the photographs, it's a standing room only crowd. Okay, and one of the things I think I needed to emphasize. City right over here, Fred Law. So he would actually was it? You told me right after this. Workshop, you went to start uh, changing your form. Yeah, it was your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so he has created, I think he turned one acre into an aquaponics farm. And believe it or not, from what we can tell, uh, that farm at the time was probably the biggest in the United States.
production wise. And then of course he's got them more funding and expanding out even more. Okay. But anyway, this is where the aquaponics craze started for us. There are other people starting it, I think, uh, on the Big Island, um, but this is for us, and that's because of Harry. Okay, in response, we have to start to, like I said, uh, continue to address all of the concerns, all of the requests coming in. So workshops, 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 workshops. Uh, these are just a few. State Hospital Aquaponic Workshop, Chinese Catfish, one at Mary's Garden. Uh, there's a DHHL um, Aquaponic Workshop in, um, in Kapolei and Palolo Elementary <laughs> to students, I mean teachers with the water quality workshop. You know, like I said, they just were coming in so fast and one of the challenges is keeping up with these requests. Okay, the good news is that we were being rewarded uh, with the work that we were doing. So we were getting some press, actually pretty good press too. <coughs> Starting off with the, on the left, with the uh, Honolulu Star Advertiser um, news articles. Um, that's the state hospital project that we got some really good press on. And Pololo Elementary. Then the middle one is a <coughs> magazine from, uh, th that the university produces. Um, that one they hit, they highlighted the um, group work that's being done in Waimanalo and also I know, yep, yeah, Milton's here, the work that's being done at the Waiava prison, okay? And one of the interesting articles, an editor for Honolulu Magazine, Hawaiian Airlines, came out to <laughs> Windward and wanted to do an article. And then so we obliged and he came up with this one. And what's the interesting part about, I didn't realize the distribution that Honolulu Magazine gets <laughs> all over the mainland, you know? So this really got us uh, some good publicity. And you can see Leonala here also made it into that particular uh, article. Okay, almost there, last one. One of the projects I was actually introduced to, this is, I think, Dean Gato was the first one to introduce me to her leave, which I'll talk about in a little while. This is a Waikolo, Waikolo local fish pond project. And I will get hooked up with her lead. I think Sheila Cybron is out here also. Yeah. And we, we formed a nonprofit and started to figure out what are we going to do. And one of the things we, we immediately tried for, um, her actually was behind the main guy, um, trying to get some funding to try and do some curriculum development. And he got two. And these are not <coughs> trivial. They're over a million dollars each, okay? And so you can really start to do something and then have some major impacts. <clears throat> and some of the outcomes, oh, Dr. Early and Wright is also here too. But, and I saw, see, one more board member. <laughs> yeah. But some awards being generated, but took in the bottom part, the outputs. We got like, and I still kind of question, 70,000 students have gone through the curriculum statewide. And then over 3,500 teachers have been trained you know, in this facet of Hawaiiana, if you want to call it that. Most important is take a look at some of the awards being uh, given to the people that were involved, okay? so. I think Herb Lee, this is a recent one, Champions of Change, Washington, D.C. Dr. William Wright. I don't know, you're going to have to explain more about that one. I don't know much about it. Civil rights. Huh? Civil rights. Okay. And then Sheila Sardron. Actually, if there's any person that we can point to as being the instigator, <laughs> it's her. It's her. <laughs> she, she came up to her community work days and then she, she had an idea, why don't I try to use this for my students and the snowball and anyway, she, but she would be, yeah, 
<laughs> In the past, this was the most operandi. Because with the work about with fish, you got to take care of them. So the grandkids came along and they helped out. <laughs> uh, don't get me wrong. It says, you know, if you talk to them, they love doing this kind help, Come help grandpa and grandma. They just love this stuff. But that's not my idea of having fun anymore. <laughs> my idea is doing this kind of stuff more and more. Okay? So I, I can. I guess the bottom line is I'm not going to be the superhero like Willis Motooka and those guys. I will help as best I can, but don't expect me to do what I used to do for sure. Okay? And with that, I can extend on behalf of Harry, Joan, Christine, and myself the sincerest mahalo and aloha that I can. as much to say what I have so much to say. <laughs> and that is to say, um, you all know that I do not make any effort to make anybody feel good at <laughs> I just make no effort at all. But I do take a great deal of pride and make a lot of effort in trying to do good for people in the long run. And that includes classroom students, such as Linda, Warren, where's Vernon? Vernon somewhere. Vernon, who else? Um, Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> classroom students, and they're the only ones who understand everything I say in aquaculture. Um, but they've also done very well for themselves. And I feel really good about that. Um, there's some people who just came into the lab and I worked with them and I'm really pleased to have done what I attempted to do with them and that's Ping Sun's daughter and Jensen's daughter. And some people I just worked with for a long, intimately, um, relatively, not, not that kind of intimate, but, <laughs> 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 but but work work closely with and, and that's Shan and you know she doubled and tripled her salary. I don't know what it is. But that's a good thing. And I really, really pleased that I've known her and and I enjoyed her company. And and then there's the rest of you and you know that. And I, I enjoyed your company, I still do. And that's my goodbye. <laughs> Chair and Clyde 
actually he been after he left the OI consultant back to join the UH and he been as major PI for CDSA project for 24 years, if I mistake. And it's not because Harry leaked any information. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have to make this one very clear. <laughs> because we've been criticized about <laughs> whether we are fair or not. But I want to say the Regional Aquaculture Center is run by the stakeholders, by industry, everybody voted for that. So it's because he's capable. Yeah. Dr. Tamaru is capable. It's not because Harry leaked any information to us. And before we give the award, I the appreciation to them, I probably want to say something about what I know them. And, you know, I'm older than Clyde, but uh, because he said you have to be 40 years before you can retire. And, you know, I grew up in Taiwan, I went to Japan, and from Japan come here. So I came to Hawaii, hasn't reached 40 years. So I cannot retire. So I have to continue working here. I'm in Hawaii for 40 years before I can retire. And but I know him since the day one, not the real day one, but in the first year, 79, when I come to Hawaii, I know him. I know he is a person. I think like an extension is talking about he's probably that guy or whatever. Anyway, I remember we went to catch the milkfish food stop, and in the night time he just go out. And I dive in and he catches the lobster. I, I don't know how to swim, so you're catching lobster. <laughs> but I, I love lobster. So I love lobster. <laughs> and he told me how to eat steak because I come from Japan. As you guys know, in Japan, the steak is very expensive, right? So we can already eat naminiku. You know, naminiku is very thin, you know, like the hot pot type of thing. So I never see the steak. And so we went to the popular ranch. And he will buy a steak, you know, two pounds or something like that. So, <laughs> so he's barbecue, I didn't know what's barbecue about, so he barbecued it and put it in front of me. He said, I said, is that for everybody? He said, no, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, I feel now, I still didn't know how to eat one pound of steak. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been together since then, and, and I really appreciate um, have a chance to walk in together and really as my career really is what Clyde helped me. Then after that when we start to walk and we know how to raise the fish, take the fish, but we are not smart enough. You know, I don't know him, but I know I didn't pass my biochemistry class. <laughs> you know, I failed. So I'm not smart enough. So <laughs> a couple of years later and yeah, you know, we need to get a smart guy. So that's the time I started working. <laughs> for area call. He's about chemistry, so he helped us to do that. So I really appreciate, it in terms of my personal career, although this is my, not my entire speech, but <laughs> career. <laughs> career <laughs> but the key important here I want to tell everybody here is a teamwork is so important. You know, through his talk, he's talking about how his success, everybody's success, by the and like me, I come here because when I was a kid, my mother told me how to speak Taiwanese. Right? Then I went, went to the elementary school, I have to start to pick up Mandarin. Then I went to Japan, I have to learn Japanese. <laughs> and when I come to the US, I have to learn Pidgin English. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you until now, the R and L, I couldn't combine to, you know, really pronounce correctly. Right? So I already call him correct or cry. <laughs> so I have someone who will help me to do something. And, uh, you know, I always have a teamwork, so I have a good team. And right now, you know, Mary is, so I will have a, her to help me to proceed to give both of them certificate uh, as an appreciation. And just in case if I say something that I'll be in private, so Mandarin or Japanese. Okay. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to just use my voice. Um, so, this is a book that Ching Chang is going to give to both uh, Clyde and Harry. 
and we decided to pick a little passage and read it to you guys. Um, I don't know if you want to explain a little bit about the book and your hope behind it, but okay. So well, the book is, is again, it's not an alpha book. I think that they've been spent enough time, 40 years, I think it's enough. I, I like having to have a chance to enjoy your life. And, uh, <laughs> So it's one of those inspirational books that you can open to and any day you get a little inspirational quote. So for these two amazing gentlemen, we pick this one. Life becomes meaningful when we shoulder responsibilities. Avoiding responsibilities makes our life empty. And I think that everybody in this room who has worked with either Harry or Kai can agree that these two gentlemen have shouldered responsibilities in good times and in bad, when it's an attractive option and when it makes them most, I don't know, I don't want to use the word hated, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. They'll shoulder the responsibility if it means that it will improve our development for aquaculture here in Hawaii, and not just Hawaii, but also there's been not much mention of uh, aquaculture development in the Pacific Islands uh, this evening, but both of these gentlemen, through CTSA research and other research as well, have put a lot of time and energy into building up the aquaculture industry elsewhere. And whether it's through their time in person or through the publications they created, uh, everything that they've done has just really helped to improve our industry. So with that, we'd like to give you these books. <laughs>
dissolved after that. I moved here on the advice of a country a doctor who said, take that boy to an island where the breezes blow and he'll be fine. He was four years old, my daughter was five, and we came, we didn't know anybody, we didn't, we knew nothing. I worked in insurance and then I went to work at the uh, Oceanic Institute, but I told Clyde, we kind of, you know, liked each other and whatnot, but I told him I will never get married again because it was too awful to get divorced, <laughs> finally. <laughs> so when my dad, when he asked me to marry him, I turned him down five times. <laughs> so thank you for being consistent. <laughs> And when my, when my, uh, I finally did accept, I did call my father, and I wanted my parents to come meet Clyde. And when he was saying he was making dinner, he was peeling carrots and potatoes. We were going to have stew that evening. So he was bent over peeling carrots and potatoes uh, into an empty Tide box. And that's when my father walked in, and he said, Clyde? do you know what you're doing? And he says, yeah, I'm peeling carrots and potatoes. He says, no, I mean marrying my daughter. <laughs> and then the 2-H um, steak thing came when we would go home and help uh, at the ranch whenever we could. Uh, because I grew up on a cattle ranch, we raised our own beef and we had it processed and aged and whatever. And the first time he went up there, we had a steak. And it's like, you know, we never cut it and, and let the juices run out or whatever. So he was served a steak and he says, this is a roast. <laughs> Am I supposed to share it? But that's how they would pay. We didn't want any money. It was family. And so what we do is we bring home coolers of um, frozen beef, hamburger steaks, whatever, put it in the hotel. Um, kitchen freezer overnight and then come on home and Harry I don't know what I would have done without your support when I had his medical incident you were my pillar of strength and I love you till the end of my days of being there for me we talked almost daily and we got through it so thank you Harry and Clyde I finally said yes, and it's forever. <laughs>